Once upon a time, there was a young man spring skiing with his buddies up at a ski resort, Whistler. They skied hard all day. They went for dinner, had a few beers together. He's walking home all alone in the dark, and he cuts through his deserted parking lot. Off in the corner on this little street lamp, there's this huge garbage can turned over, all this stinky, smelly refuse lying around. But he looks to the future and he says, this isn't good for the bears. They could eat this stuff and get sick. It's not good for the community because in a few hours there's going to be families, young kids. That's not a good mix with bears. So on his own accord with his bare hands, he proceeds to pick up every stinky, smelly piece of garbage, dirty diapers, slimy, rotten food, cleans the entire area, seals the can, and goes on his way home. Now, there's nobody around, not another living soul. So there's nobody to motivate, nobody to persuade, nobody to impact. My question to you today, the test, is that leadership? Raise your hands if you feel that's leadership. About half of you, which is normal, because of the half that didn't raise your hand, some of you aren't sure you need time to think about it, some of you don't think it's leadership. And there's a few of you who are like me, you go, hey, why commit when you don't have to? Let's see where this goes. <laughs> but it's leadership in its purest form. And I have two objectives in the next few minutes. The first, get us all to agree that it is, in fact, leadership. And the second is to understand the impact this could have on our organizations. More importantly, our young people, if we can get on the same page. So where did this idea originate? I was a top salesperson, the leader in an international investment firm. And unfortunately, like a lot of companies still do today, because of my proven track record in sales, they made me a manager. I mean, think about it. I could qualify, book appointments, present, and close as good as the best. So why not put me in charge of an international sales force with the aim of getting that performance out of others? The problem is that the skill sets and talent that made me great at sales are not those that are acquired in an effective manager or coach. I didn't have the patience, awareness, or the interest in understanding and leveraging the talent and ability in others. So I failed. And I failed miserably. This caused me pain, a great sense of loneliness, and I felt this shame. And feeling shame when you're not sure we did bad or wrong brought me to the closest point of insanity that I've ever experienced. Fortunately, from failure, there are lessons if you're open to them. And after working exclusively with business owners and their management teams for over the last 25 years, I've seen that placing leaders in management roles is an epidemic and it can be destructive to the leader, the organization, and the employees. Do you think it's possible that you could be a great leader, but a train wreck as a manager or coach? What if I was to tell you that up to 80% of the time, sending the leader to be trained as a manager or coach is like sending a duck to ego school? Too often we define leaders by the impact they have on others. I get to prove this out every day by asking an audience to define leadership. What are the characteristics of a great leader? And I get things like, the ability to motivate others, or a person who gives clear direction. And then there's these statements that we fall in love with, like, leaders are only as strong as their teams, which suggests you have to have a team to be a leader. Or you're not a leader until you develop another leader who develops a leader, which straight to the heart. Sounds fantastic. But you have to be able to develop people to be a great leader. We seem to take this stuff like spaghetti when it comes to finding leadership, and we throw it at the wall to see what sticks, and if it sounds cool, it stays. But this causes confusion. And this confusion exists for good reason, because the best authors that write about leadership, best speakers that speak to it, even the very best schools like Harvard that teach it are often confused and the worst don't know. Why do we continue to define leaders by the impact they have on others when the birthplace, the birthplace's ability to look at the future and do what you feel is right. Over 60 years ago, when she refused to vacate her seat on that bus, was Rosa Parks concerned about who was following her? Because if she was, she'd been very disappointed. Nobody was following her. She was a criminal, breaking the law. So the bus driver phones the police, please come on board the bus. Impossible for me to believe this was in my lifetime. The law that she's breaking, she won't vacate her seat for a white person. So the police... The bus driver phones the police, then they arrest her and they take her downtown and they throw her in jail. A lot of people don't know that because of this, she was fired from her job the next morning. Her husband wouldn't speak to her for months out of embarrassment. Yet it was that same bad behavior that was the gateway to Rosa Parks eventually earning the Medal of Freedom and bless her soul, put her in the history books forever 
as an unquestionable leader. Raise your hands if you think Nelson Mandela was a leader. Right? I mean, go Google the top 50 leaders of all time, and his name always comes up. So when Nelson originally stood up against white supremacy, did anybody follow him to jail for 27 years? Yet it was that same bad behavior that was the birthplace of why you just put your hands up just now when I asked you if he was a leader. How about this? You. You were on the bus that day with Rosa Parks when she wouldn't get up. Or you. You were on the docks that day with Nelson Mandela when he wouldn't sit down. All of you here were with one of them. But let's pretend they both died in jail, like some leaders do. Do you still consider your friend to be a leader even though nobody heard of them, nobody followed them, nobody was inspired by them? Because I do. Why? Leaders look to the future and do what they feel is right, period. What they feel can be seen in their purpose, cause passion, or the reason for being, and that ability to look at the future is this innate capacity to accurately predict or anticipate a direction that at first might not make sense to anybody in this room or anybody in this planet for that matter. And it doesn't matter whether we're talking about sport, science, business, medicine, a social movement, or even a drama production. The definition remains the same. I get to work with management teams all the time. First thing we want to do is we want to define leadership. So I write leader on the left-hand side of the whiteboard. I invite them to give me the characteristics of great leader, and I just start writing whatever they give me. And a lot of what they give me has to do with the ability to motivate and persuade others. So on the right-hand side, I write manager. Give me all the characteristics of a great manager. And they give me much the same stuff every single time. But our research clearly indicates that leaders and managers are not synonyms. They don't mean the same thing. But a manager and a coach do. A manager and a coach mean the same thing because both a manager and a coach get things done efficiently and effectively through others. How about Wayne Gretzky's leader in hockey? I mean, not just a leader, but a legend. His ability to anticipate and execute was like magic. His fans thought they had eyes in the back of his head. And if you don't follow hockey, Reggie McCall and rugby, Pelé and soccer, Michael Jordan basketball, same idea. So to make my case, I just need all of you in this room to agree, or at least consider, <laughs> at least consider that both team sports and business are performance activities. That's it. That's all I need to do. And I'm, asking, I'm not asking you to cross a huge bridge here in your thinking. Think about it. Team sports and business both have teams, both have players, both have a game to play, both have win losing strategies, both have competitors. And both have managers or coaches who are charged with coordinating getting the most out of the players. In both team sports and business, the players who continually exceed our expectations are considered the leaders. The managers coach the players, the coaches manage the players. Say that either way, it doesn't matter because those two words mean the same thing. So what happens when you take a top player, a leader, and make them a manager or coach? We hired researchers to find out. We chose basketball, hockey, and baseball because all three have a low barrier to entry and all three have over 100 years of reliable data to research and compare. We want to know how does that top player do when they have to get that performance out of others. But here's the thing. We set the bar very low. The teams that they coached or managed just had to win as many games as they lost. It's called a .5 winning average. If they could hit that bar or above, we'd consider them successful. Are you with me? In hockey, of the top 100 players of all time, those that went on the coach, four of them were in the top 15. Wayne Gretzky, Brian Trotche, Larry Robinson, Phil Esposito. Now, Brian and Larry coached their teams to lose two losing seasons, quit out the first season. Esposito's team barely had a winning year, then a losing year, he quit. Wayne Gretzky, considered by most to be the best hockey player of all time, coached the Phoenix Coyotes to four losing seasons in a row. Suggested in the research he would have been fired in his first year, but he owned part of the team. Basketball is not much different. Will Chamberlain ranked second of 100. He coaches team of two out of three losses, quit out the first season. Magic Johnson ranked six out of 100. He coaches team to losing season. He quit before the season even ended. Now, whenever you're trying to support a case or a hypothesis in your research, there's always going to be exceptions. Larry Bird, ninth best player of all time, definitely a winning coach. Over a .6 winning average, took his team to national finals. But here's what I need to plant in your brain today. Larry Bird's the only one, the only one of the top 100 players of all time to ever, did I say ever? Ever be named Coach of the Year. 
In baseball, take a player who's never played baseball and uh, take one that's played in the major leagues, put them both in charge of coaching a team, they both have the same chance of bringing that team to a 0.5 winning average. What this research told us, in no uncertain terms, is that if you were to choose Steve Jobs in technology, Michael Jordan in sports, Louis Pasteur in science medicine, Gandhi or even Mother Teresa to coach your team, that team's got a one in five chance. A one in five chance of just getting to a 50% winning level. So if I'm gonna try and sell you a high performing car like a Porsche, I tell you it's got a one in five chance of running properly, would you buy it? It's, got a 50, it's basically got a 20% chance of running on half of its cylinders. So here's what keeps me up at night. Why in business do we continue to take our top people, our top, our top accountants, our top engineers, our top, our top salespeople, and make them managers when the data doesn't support it? Why do we continue to destroy our leaders by making them managers based solely on their talent as in terms of their performance, when the data doesn't support it. I love the movie Miracle on Ice. True story about Herb Brooks. Herb Brooks, one of the top 50 coaches of all time, took the 1980 men's Olympic hockey team to gold. They had to beat the Russians to do it. Now, interesting note, Herb Brooks tried out for the US men's Olympic hockey team in an earlier life, but he got cut because he wasn't good enough. Now, he came close. They could only take 20 players. He was the 21st player to get cut. So as head coach of the U.S. men's Olympic hockey team, he must have had a lot of empathy for his 21st player that he had to cut, Ralph Cox. Now in the movie, he calls Ralph to his office during a practice and lets him go. And this movie is spectacular because they completely replicate all the plays on the ice and even some of the stuff that Herb did off the ice, like the Herbies, totally authentic. But when it comes to firing Ralph Cox, Hollywood and Disney miss out on such a great scene because what happened in the movie didn't happen. According to Ralph Cox, moments before the celebration dinner, sending a team off the Olympics, right at the last minute, he gets summoned to Herb Brooks' hotel room. When he arrives, Herb Brooks can't even look at him. Herb Brooks is pacing back and forth, juggler pumping, face flushed, eyes welled. It's actually this young player who speaks first to his coach three words. It's okay, Herb. It's okay. And Herb Brooks stops and looks at Ralph and says, Ralph, I am so sorry. This is the most difficult decision I've ever had to make in my life. And they sit down like gentlemen, eyeball to eyeball. Herb Brooks goes over all the reasons of the wrong decision. When they got to leave, they would have hugged. But men didn't hug back then, so they shook hands. But here's the thing. They left with this eternal love and respect for each other which completely blows my mind. Can you imagine? You're this young man, your dream is to play on the US men's Olympic hockey team, and the one person that takes that dream away from you, you leave with this eternal love and respect for that person? It doesn't make sense. But that's not the end of the story. And I have a difficult time finishing this story emotionally, so I'm gonna ask you to bear with me. Picture this, years later, Years after this event, this young man, Ralph Cox, who's not so young anymore, picks up a Sports Illustrated magazine. He starts reading this article. The article's an interview with his coach, which was done years past, just days after the gold medal event. Ralph's reading this for the first time. You with me? In the interview, Herb is asked, Herb, there you are the other night. Your team's on the top podium. Gold medals around, you know, around their chest. Chest pumped out, Star Spangled Banner being raised behind them. Everyone in Lake Placid, no, no, no. Everyone in America standing at attention with a hand over their chest singing that national anthem with such pride. Such pride because in an era where America needed to win at anything, against the odds, against every single person's expectation, you and your team beat the Russians to advance and take the gold medal. At that moment, at that second in time, what's going through your mind as head coach? And Herb Brooks said, I was thinking about Ralph Cox, and I was wishing he could be there. Great coaches and managers 
get people. They put the needs of the team before their own needs. Empathetic meters off the charts, narcissistic meters don't even register. They have the courage to enter the danger. Or as my friend Brené Brown says, lean into the discomfort and have those difficult conversations when the bar is not being met when it comes to performance, behavior, or personality. They not only have the courage, they have the decency. Ralph Cox knew why he was being summoned to Herb Brooks' hotel room, he told me. Because with great managers and coaches and that courage to have critical conversations, everyone on the team knows where they stand. In our business, we call it healthy. Let's go back to leadership. You want to talk about Steve Jobs as a leader? I will argue with you until the sun goes down and comes back up again. Because he was no fluke. He proved it twice at Apple and at Pixar. His ability to look to the future and stick with what he felt was right? Epic. Unbelievable. But based on those abilities, if you'd taken him and forced him, coerced him, or incentivized him into a position of management, Apple and Pixar probably wouldn't exist today. So here's what I need you to do. Before you came in this room today, or now, going back to the beginning of the story, that young man who cleaned up that entire area for the welfare of the bears and the safety of the community with nobody around, if you now believe that to be leadership behavior, the behavior of a leader, could you do me a favor, please? Could you please stand up? Could you rise? Wow, every single one of you. That means you can all sit down. <laughs> because I'm speaking to every single one of you. I'm not speaking to you, actually. I'm up here on my hands and knees like this, and I am begging you. I am pleading with you. I need your help. I desperately need your help to share distinction, interconnection, and value in understanding the difference between these two words. Because not only does it impact the future of our organizations, much more important, much more critical, our young people. Our young people in better understanding themselves and helping them to find their way to make a difference. Thank you.